News starts right now. We are keeping our, our eye on a wildfire happening in Bastrop County. We first told you about this at five o'clock. Fire agencies responding on Park Road AI. Yeah, according to Bastrop's County Emergency Management, the first fire is along Power Plant Road moving towards Lake Bastrop South Shore. Now here's what we know at this point. Residents in this area have been told to evacuate. No word yet on how many people are affected. Also, an aircraft will be making water and fire retardant drops to help slow down the spread of the flames. Yeah, we're going to continue to follow this developing story both on air and online. She was accused of stealing more than $150,000 from a property management company that she worked for. Then investigators said that she stole again, this time while serving as treasurer for a school district booster club. And today, that defendant avoided prison for now after a judge gave her a short extension to pay back her victims. Dylan Collier was in court and has more on the woman's plan. Ashley Ring walked into court this morning facing a possible prison sentence of 10 years, but was able to buy herself a bit more time, convincing Judge Michael Mary that she's close to getting equity out of property to pay back her victims in two separate felony fraud cases, a total of more than $201,000. Ms. Ring does have property that she believes will satisfy restitution owing on both of these cases. Ring last fall pleaded no contest to misappropriating well over six figures while serving as office manager of a local company between 2011 and 2016, using the stolen funds, according to court records, to acquire a boat, several vehicles, and ironically, land. A four-count indictment filed against Ring last year accused her of carrying out a similar theft scheme while serving as treasurer of East Central Independent School District's Future Farmers of America Booster Club, a position she held even after being indicted in the first fraud case. Ms. Ring, what do you want to say to your victims in both I'm cases? I'm advising her not to speak to the public at this time. The potential restitution held up by this 2017 lawsuit filed against Ring by the property management company that once employed her. While Ring's attorney was able to convince Judge Mary the case is close to being resolved, the attorney who filed suit against Ring told us today that is news to him and that the two sides haven't had any conversations on a possible settlement. Ring is scheduled back in court March 1st, which means she essentially was given six weeks additional time to pay back her victims. Her attorney would not say whether Ring has made any restitution payments at this point. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. We have an update now to a crash that we first told you about last night on the night beat. San Antonio police have arrested one person in connection to that fatal crash on the northwest side. 27 year old Derek Reyes seen on the right is charged with two counts of intoxication manslaughter. That crash happened just before seven o'clock Monday evening on the Loop 410 access road near Fredericksburg. Police say that Reyes was allegedly speeding when he hit a sedan from behind. A man standing near the intersection there was hit by one of the vehicles. That man and the front seat passenger of the sedan were both killed. The sedan driver and the back seat passenger were taken to a hospital. Reyes bond is set at $200,000. Two people in their 20s in critical condition after police say a woman allegedly shot them. It happened last night just before 10 at an apartment complex off Ben's Engelman Road near Fort Sam Houston and I-35. Police say a woman was arguing with the couple in a doorway. When they say a man closed the door, this woman allegedly shot through it. One of those bullets hit the victim in the neck, the other in the back. Police are still looking for that suspect. 2021 saw a spike in homicides in San Antonio, yet crime stats show that there was actually less violent crime overall last year. 160 homicides in 2021. That's the most since 1994. That represents a 23% jump over the year 2020. However, the total amount of violent crime dropped 9%. San Antonio Police Chief William McManus telling a city council committee today that the recent law that allows the unlicensed carry of handguns by people legally allowed to have them was not behind the city's gun violence. There are no more criminals carrying guns since that law was passed than there were before. It's not your law-abiding citizens that are pulling out guns and shooting people because they're mad at them. 
or because they, they make them angry, uh, because they cut them off. Overall, total crime rose 2% from 2020 to 2021, and that was driven by a bump in property crimes. A petite woman desperate for help after losing everything she owns to a fire. What's even more shocking about it is that the fire was started, got out of control. The way the fire started got out of control to begin with. Our Jaffney Gray sat down with that woman who says her life has been devastated by someone else's mistake. All that hard work was all gone. 50 year old Belinda Martinez can't help but be consumed with emotion. Friday afternoon will be the last time her mobile home would be standing here on Jose Olivia Lane. When I opened the front door, I saw smoke. Smoke coming from fast moving flames that Poteet fire officials say started from a neighbor's unattended trash fire. Before she knew it, all this was already on fire and all this back here was on fire. I just froze. I didn't know what to do. And then I saw the fireman screaming at me to get out. Martinez is disabled and has several medical issues. She says she had just furnished her home. I was watching my, my house burn down. And her home wasn't the only one. Her son's home, which is on her property, was destroyed. Where do we go? We're just stuck in the van. Martinez used this ramp to get in and out of her home with her wheelchair or power chair, which both were destroyed by the fire. Now, fortunately, a company was gracious enough to donate this RV to give her a place to sleep. Unfortunately, it has no electricity, no running water, and getting in and out of it by herself is a major challenge. And if I go in, I have to stay there until somebody helps me out. Martinez said her neighbors have apologized. She prays others learn to never leave fires unattended. For now, she's leaning on the community, especially as the temperatures begin to drop. I don't know. I don't know how I can do it. I don't need anything big. It could be anything small, just something where I can live. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. Let's turn to COVID-19 now, taking a look at the latest numbers in Bear County. After the three-day weekend, Metro Health is reporting 5,413 new cases. That brings the seven-day moving average to 6,140. Seven new deaths to report tonight. In our hospitals, there are 1,197 people battling COVID. 249 patients in intensive care and 105 people are on ventilators. Meanwhile, the at home COVID test request website from the White House, it is now up and running. They did a soft launch after initially announcing that it would be ready tomorrow. Here's what that website looks like. It will take you to an order form from the Postal Service where you fill out your name, your address, your email. Each order will include four tests. Now it's limited to one order per residential address. According to USPS, the tests are expected to ship within the next seven to 12 days. You can find a link on our website at ksat.com. Yeah, and while you wait for those tests to get delivered, if you're in need of one right now, you can head to the Alamo Dome. Today, the first day for the federally supported testing site. It will be open seven days a week, beginning at seven in the morning till five in the evening. This site will last until February 4th. Nasal PCR tests will be used. Due to community labs testing delays, results could take up to 72 hours. Appointments required. We have a link to sign up at ksat.com. Around Texas now, an update to a story we've been following since the weekend. A Houston area Cracker Barrel manager shot and killed. We now know that Harris County deputies found the suspect and fatally shot him. Deputies say that they got numerous tips about that suspect and his connection to the botched robbery that claimed the life of Robin Balcom. The deputies found the 28 year old suspect walking down a street. They say they called his name and he took off running. Deputies say that he allegedly gestured that he had a gun and that's when deputies opened fire. That suspect was taken to a hospital where he later died. The Anti-Defamation League warns attacks on Jewish people are on the rise. This after four people taken hostage at a synagogue in Colleyville near Fort Worth. The Anti-Defamation League says the majority of the anti-Semitic incidents involve harassment and vandalism. But there have been assaults as well, and at least six times since 2016, they've been deadly. One of those hostage survivors from over the weekend is now speaking out after the nearly 11 hour situation. He says the active shooter training he'd taken months before became a reality. It absolutely saved our life. We escaped and we escaped because we kept presence of mind because we 
made plans because we strategically moved people. As the FBI continues to investigate what happened in Colleyville, FBI officials say, quote, faith-based communities have and will likely continue to be targets of violence by both domestic violent extremists and those inspired by foreign terrorists, end quote. A new Texas law takes effect today. No one is allowed to restrain unattended dogs with a chain anymore. Now, it is okay to restrain a dog. The issue is the chain or even using heavy weights. The goal of the law is to create more humane conditions for dogs. The law also requires owners to provide proper shelter and shade. San Antonio Animal Care Services suggests using a cable instead. What I like to recommend is buying three and you can braid them. So that way you have the stability of three cables um, to, you know, if you have a chewer or you have a dog that uh, ha is a little heavier in weight and it's a large dog, uh, there's still other ways to go about holding those dogs on the property um, without using chain. If you break this new law, the fine can be up to $500. And speaking of our furry friends, we're going to want to bring them in yep. here in the next couple of days because it is going to get cold, Adam. It is, and Thursday's when the cold begins. Even Wednesday night, you know, have them inside, and I think the pipes will be okay in this situation. It's just the people and the pets you want to be extra careful about, and of course, the plants as well, starting tomorrow night. And that's going to last for a few days. Today, 41 in the morning. That's exactly average. By the afternoon, we made it up to 75 officially in San Antonio, 80 Pleasanton, 82 Catula, 81 in Del Rio. Hard to believe a cold front is just a day away. Temperatures right now down in the 60s in some spots. Kerrville 66, New Braunfels here 69. Meanwhile, 70 degrees San Antonio and Uvalde, or I should say Hondo at 68. This evening, temperatures just falling into the 50s after midnight with fog developing and we'll start the day tomorrow mild in the 50s. Look at our temperature trend though. Warm tomorrow, big drop in temperature by Thursday with a wintry mix. We're going to talk about the details and how it could affect you coming up. Thank you, Adam. How many people can say they started a business at the age of six? Probably not many, but one local little girl can. What inspired her vision to be a young entrepreneur? Plus, a Department of Defense program aims to find new career paths for military veterans. We introduce you to a product of that program who is now researching the COVID-19 vaccines right here in Military City, USA. So here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. One business owner is standing up against something that happened last night. We told you about that shooting at a local Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. While we speak with one of the organizers for that event, that person says they don't want violence and they are determined to keep that event going for future generations. Plus, just take a moment and look at those long lines for COVID tests. Yeah, some people say that they've gotten so bad they're actually stretching into residential areas. Our Lee Waldman visits neighbors and calls companies for those tests. We're going to have an update for you tonight. Plus, COVID is compounding issues for school districts. Some campuses are temporarily closing and students are also scoring less on tests. We'll have those stories and more for you tonight on The Nightly. Thanks, Stephanie. The transition from military to civilian life can be tough, and it's hard sometimes for veterans to find jobs where they can use the expertise they acquired in the military. Luckily, the Department of Defense has a program that helps bridge that gap. Courtney Friedman explains that's how Texas Biomed landed a stellar Army veteran on one of their most important research teams. Phenomenal experience. Staff Sergeant Jacqueline Poinsett was in the Army for almost 13 years, rising through the ranks as a lab technician. It's working in hospitals, working in outlying clinics, drawing blood, taking samples and processing them so that doctors have the information they need to treat pa patients. When she got out of the military, she was scared she wouldn't be able to continue that type of work. Especially in the sciences and in healthcare, you just don't know what the needs are going to be when that time comes. So she utilized SkillBridge, a Department of Defense program that helps align service members with civilian jobs. It landed her here at Texas Biomed's Maximum Containment Contract Research Lab, working with renowned researcher, Dr. Ricardo Carrion Jr. Developing vaccines and therapies for more deadly agents like Ebola virus, Marburg virus, uh, anthrax plague, 
and most recently the coronavirus, COVID-19. His team helped develop the Pfizer and Novavax COVID vaccines. He says Poinsett's unique Army experiences are invaluable to the team. The training that she got in the Army, uh, she's introducing some innovations to our group to make it us be more efficient. He hopes more resources will go into placing veterans in the right job so they too can continue to serve. I don't know how many times you get to sit down at work and say you, you work with the hero, but we have a hero here at Texas Biomed. I think service is just in the blood and I think it's as a scientific community member, it's what we want to do and making the world a better and healthier place for all of us. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We still got some warming up to do. Is that right? Before the temperature completely <laughs> falls off. Yeah, let, let's focus on the warming before the freezing. That's funny because I'm starting right off with the cold and that's All what right. we're going to jump okay. into. <laughs> so we're just going to dive right into it. I will point out tomorrow, yes, it'll be sunny and warm. We'll have some morning fog to start the day. Then a sunny afternoon, it'll be up right near 80 degrees. Cold, blustery, gusty, windy on your Thursday with a light wintry mix. So tomorrow, nothing to worry about. More of the same, even warmer. Thursday, that's the day we have to watch. Now, here's what you can plan for, just planning to head to Thursday already. Let's get right to it. And light freezing rain and sleet. So a little wintry mix developing. And remember, the sleet is just a frozen raindrop. So it's those little ice pellets that you can often hear ting, 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 ting on the windows and especially on windshield. Freezing rain is when the raindrops freeze on contact and create that slick light glaze and it's going to be light in nature. We're not expecting a whole lot in terms of accumulation. So our primary concern bridges and overpasses. What's helping us all the sunshine and warm temperatures today, sunshine and warm temperatures tomorrow. The ground should retain a good amount of that warmth, but the bridges and overpasses that are exposed to the cold air and the gusty winds, that's where we could see some slick spots. But I think it's going to be mostly localized in nature, not necessarily very widespread in terms of all the bridges and overpasses. But you'll want to drive with caution on those bridges and overpasses. Also, windy and cold on Thursday. Uh, temperatures in the 30s, but with the gusty winds up to 40, it's going to feel like the upper teens to near 20. So here's the situation. Cold front hits tomorrow night. Then right behind it on its heels, we've got this dip in the upper level flow. That upper level disturbance over the Four Corners region already dropping some precipitation in Arizona and New Mexico. That's the disturbance that's going to come up and over the cold air and generate a little bit of light precipitation. So tomorrow, the morning fog. Our future cast shows that 7 a.m. could be dense in spots, so I do think that'll have an impact on your morning commute tomorrow, the fog. And then by the afternoon, sunshine right near 80. That cold front, 4 o'clock, just about to move into the hill country. By about 9 o'clock, it hits San Antonio. And then midnight, our entire KSAT 12 viewing area is behind that cold front. Then we get into Thursday, low clouds, gusty winds, cold temperatures in the 30s, and we'll have a few hit or miss little sprinkles developing, and they should then turn into more like sprinkles of sleet and sprinkles of light freezing rain. As we get to the noon hour and especially into the afternoon, it's not going to be hitting everybody at the same time. We're all going to have a different type of precipitation during a period of time throughout the day. But I do think all of us will have the opportunity for a bit of frozen precipitation and a wintry mix. Even locations south of San Antonio, I think as we get into the afternoon on Thursday, I even think you'll get a little bit of a mixture of freezing rain and sleet. But overall, we're looking at this as a low impact event with minimal accumulations on the order of a tenth of an inch of a little bit of ice or less. And that's mainly on the elevated and exposed surfaces. The only caveat is if it comes down harder than anticipated in a few spots, could get a little extra accumulation. That's just one of those outliers. That's a possibility, not a probability. All right, let's talk temperatures. 67 Holotus and Bulverde, 74 Stinson, Divine at 69 degrees, 60s and 70s across the board right now. Tomorrow, we start the day at 54, a mild morning with fog. By the afternoon, sunny, up to 78 degrees. Actually, 80 Carrizo Springs, Del Rio 83, Pleasanton 80. Elmendorf about 78 and Leon Springs 77. Then the big temperature drop hits us on Thursday. And I'm expecting our afternoon temperatures to be right near freezing with that gusty wind making it feel like we're closer to 20. Air temperatures 20s Friday morning by the afternoon will be in the upper 40s and this weekend in the 50s. Oh, okay. 
Thanks, Adam. <laughs> All right, so they're not quite full strength yet, but they are getting closer, Greg. Yeah, the starting five are back set here, and this is going to be crucial because they're going to have to beat teams at home like Oklahoma City, yeah. who is up next, in order to kind of help turn this season around. When we come back, what the Spurs have to say about that, and will Deshaun Watson ever suit up in Houston again? Coming up. a must win tomorrow night when they host the Oklahoma City Thunder since the Thunder are having a worse season compared to the Silver and Black, but not by much. They've won in only 14 games this season compared to the Spurs 16. They're in 14th position of the Western Conference compared to the Spurs 12, both right now out of the playoff and play in picture. And when you consider the Spurs have won only one game during the seven game homestand, you understand why tomorrow night's game is so important to try and get the Silver and Black back on the right track. Getting Jakob Pertl back last night helped the Spurs get out to as much as a 10 point lead against the best team in the NBA, the Phoenix Suns. After back issue who's kept him out of the win against the Clippers on Saturday. Berto bounced back to lead the Spurs with a team high 23 points, 14 rebounds, two big blocks in the 121 to 107 loss. But what is it like to have the normal starting five back together finally? It felt good. I, I think we we got rolling pretty pretty well today. Um, DJ hit some tough shots early. Like um, We have good chem chemistry with that group, um, especially lately. Um, with all these guys out, I feel like we had to play a lot of lineups that weren't used to playing with each other. So it's good to finally try and get some rhythm back into our game again. All right, for the Phoenix Suns, they're definitely making another run of the NBA championship round behind Monty Williams as their head coach. The Suns own the best record of the NBA right now to start the second half of the season. We're able to come back and win their fifth straight game here in San Antonio, even after having to play in Detroit the day before. That might explain their slow start as a team, but after being down by double digits, kicked it into another gear out, scoring the Spurs 34-16 in the fourth quarter behind Devin Booker's season high 48 points, 41 of those coming in the first three quarters. I just respect this team you know, to, to the highest level. And I understand, you know, how, how the, the level that they compete at and especially the level that they play at here in San Antonio. So I just want to be aggressive from the start. We said, you know, it was a long travel from Detroit here, but, you know, we, we got something going and, you know, everybody was a little fatigued, I could tell, including myself. And, you know, we just used each other as support to, you know, figure it out. And you may have noticed that Becky Hammond, the Spurs assistant coach, future head coach of Las Vegas Aces, was not on the Spurs bench last night. The team telling us Becky is in the NBA's health and safety protocols. Next up, Oklahoma City tomorrow night, 730, and we'll be there live starting at 5 tomorrow afternoon. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans continue to interview possible replacements for David Culley as their new head coach. Just after Culley was fired last Thursday after just one season among the candidates that have been interviewed so far, Eagles defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon, who appeared virtually today for his talk. Prior to that, the Texans also spoken to Los Angeles Chargers offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi, former Steelers Pro Bowl wide receiver Heinz Ward, now a special assistant to Florida Atlantic head coach, and former Miami Dolphins head coach Brian Flores, who you may remember was involved in talks about possible training for quarterback Deshaun Watson. That is the other offseason priority for general manager Nick Casario. What to do with Watson facing 22 civil lawsuits for sexual assault during massages. I think in particular that particular situation, um, you know, I don't think there's any is more clarity today than there was here previously, but we're going to work through it and ultimately we're going to do, you know, what we feel is best for the organization. But during an appearance on a Houston radio station today, Casario said more than likely Watson won't play for the Texans again. I think that's pretty much a foregone conclusion, but he stated that today. Yeah. Will he play again? Will he play, period? Yeah. Exactly. It's still a question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. There are health disparities that exist in our community, sometimes based on where a person lives or their race or ethnicity. A local doctor is working to try to change that. We're joined today by Dr. Lisa Ochoa, a vascular surgeon and founder of the Save Clinic here in San Antonio. Dr. Ochoa, glad to have you back here on the Q&A. We talked about some of these problems that exist here locally last time you were here, but now you have a hand in a trial, a clinical trial that's looking to expand access to people who are really underserved. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so the last time we talked, we talked about how diabetes and peripheral arterial disease is very prevalent in underserved communities here in San Antonio or Hispanic and African-American communities. 
When we treat as a vascular doctor, these blood vessels are the small blood vessels below the knee. And in diabetics, those are very, very challenging blood vessels to treat. And of all the technology that's out there, we haven't really found an answer. And so what's exciting is that Abbott has this new trial with a very innovative technology where they take something like this, and this is the big one called a stent, but they have an absorbable stent technically called a scaffold that we put in these small little vessels. It eludes chemotherapeutic drug to decrease inflammation. So hopefully this vessel stays open more so than our traditional therapies right now. What is unique about this trial? I mean, it, this isn't just something that usually happens in certain parts of our community. I mean, you usually think of trials as being in an academic kind of setting. Is it, am I correct in that? You're, you're exactly right. These levels of clinical trials with this high tech technology usually happens in academic centers. And so it is unique that I, as a private practice vascular surgeon in the underserved area of San Antonio, I'm able to offer this population enrollment into this clinical trial. I am fortunate that Abbott uh, has a corporate culture of making sure that they diversify their patient populations, that they include those patients that truly can benefit from this, and not only that, to include uh, the diversification of their researchers. I am probably not your typical clinical researcher, and so creating this trial that's accessible to a practice like mine not only expands what I can offer, but what it offers this community and offers the better information that they can use to see if this uh, intervention benefits those who truly need it. Those with diabetes, those with peripheral arterial disease, those who are at risk for amputations. And, and diabetes, those problems you mentioned, they are so prevalent here in Bear County. Yeah. So who can take part in this trial? Who are you looking for? So we're looking for patients who have diabetes and uh, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, but really who have a diabetic foot ulcer. And so that is one of how you first come into the trial. And here at our clinic, we can screen whether you qualify for that study or not. And so I encourage uh, anyone who, uh, whether it's a physician or a patient or a family member, if you have a, a, a patient who has diabetes and a foot ulcer, and if you can send them to the SAFE clinic and we can see if they're a candidate for this trial and for leading edge technology. Yeah, SAVE clinic. It's the San Antonio Vascular and Endovascular Clinic. That's a place to start if you're interested in this trial. I, I, I'm also curious because it's, it's something we know about in San Antonio. That the, I mean, it's just a fact. If you live south of Hildebrand, I believe it is, your life expectancy isn't as long as if you live north of Hildebrand. Are you hoping that corporations will take, take a, a, a part in more studies like the one that you're doing with Abbott? I think we all have a uh, responsibility to serve our communities. And when uh, our biggest corporate leaders take the initiative to incorporate these patients and realize that they need to be a part of uh, these trials, of opportunities, of access to health care, I think that's how we're really going to make a big difference. And I, I am really proud to say that Abbott has stepped up and made this a priority of theirs to make sure that the appropriate patient populations and those who are underserved get to be a part of this trial, get the information so we, we can figure out how we can best treat these patients. And this is the only study in South Texas the, like uh, this. The Safe Clinic is the only site in South Texas for this particular trial. Best way to contact the Safe Clinic if people are interested in taking part? You can call our office at 210-610-SAVE or 210-610-7283. 210-610-SAVE, S-A-V-E. Dr. Lisa Ochoa, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate the information. Thank you for your time. Have a good night. And take care. We'll be right back. It's Dream Week in the Alamo City, and part of the mission is to embrace ideas and dreams. And one little entrepreneur is hoping to make a big name for herself with her idea. Max Massey introduces us to a six-year-old girl who's using a 3D printer to make her dreams a reality and maybe even inspire others. Well, this sounds fun. This is challenging, and I like challenging things and challenging activities, so I decided this would be good for me. Meet entrepreneur Sonia Martinez. She started her own business, and it's called the Honey Breeze Collection. I want everybody to be feel happy and unique. 
Sonia wanted to make earrings for her friends and she had access to a 3D printer. The next thing you know, her company was up and running. It all kind of just seamlessly merged together. She made a logo in probably about two or three minutes and uh, had her business name kind of figured out relatively quick. The name of it is the Honeybirds Collection and the reason we named it like that is because well, that's my middle name, Honey Breeze. Some of Sonia's earrings are being made by this 3D printer right now as we speak, and her story really shows why Dream Week is so important for San Antonio. Dream Week is all about following dreams, right? And that is why we got together with our community partners and some of our local high schools to come out and demonstrate their technology. We're hoping that's going to spark some passion, you know, create excitement for these jobs in uh, STEM. The program's happening over the next two weeks here at Port San Antonio, hope to inspire the future scientists, astronauts, engineers, and in Sonia's case, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs with attention to detail. I don't want to make earrings out of those because they might snap and break and I don't want my earrings breaking. And already this six-year-old is learning business firsthand. I do take card or cash. <laughs> Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. I have bags. All right, how many earrings did Max end up buying? Because how, how do you say no? She wants everybody to feel happy and unique. Yes. I love that. Yeah. I'm betting Max had to buy a few because you, you can't tell her no. No. Nope. She's she, the ultimate she salesman. She takes card and cash. Yeah. You know? She makes it easy. <laughs> All right. It is 68 degrees out there. We'll be uh, pining for 68 here in about 48 hours. Ooh, 68 is going to be a long ways away. Come Thursday. Yeah, we're not going to see it for several days after then. So this evening, we're at 70 actually right now, officially at the airport, down to 60 at 10 o'clock. Then after midnight, we're in the 50s, and we stay in the 50s all night long. Actually, look, look what happens to our morning low temperatures in the days ahead. Thursday morning, we're in the 30s. Friday and Saturday, mid to upper 20s. So more freezing temperatures on the way. With it, well, a light wintry mix. We'll talk about it in just a bit. In the buzz today, a sinking selfie taken on top of a submerged vehicle in a frozen river. That was just one of the bizarre highlights from this scene in Ontario, Canada. Now, this started when a car was spotted speeding across an iced over river. The careening car yeah. broke through the ice, of course, forcing bystanders to spring into action. They used a kayak to rescue the driver inside. A witness says after the woman was rescued that she claimed it was fun and said she would, quote, totally do it again. Yeah, that's her standing on top of the vehicle, presumably after she took her selfie. Police say the driver was charged with dangerous operation of a motor vehicle. How do you think her rescuers, the bystanders, felt Yeah, about I mean, that? come on. Yeah. She's trying to be rescued taking a selfie. Yeah. Not happy. Nope. Don't like that story. All right, a dog named Buddy trapped in a tight spot in Arizona, rescued after getting his head stuck in a cinder block wall. The dog had reportedly gotten loose, was found trapped, Text from the Arizona Humane Society called in, went to work, chiseling away at the wall and eventually freeing Buddy. I want to know what's on the other side of the wall that right. he was trying to get to. What was he so curious yeah. about? Well, the dog was treated and later reunited with its owner. Ensuring a pair of legs. Yes, it is possible. And supermodel Heidi Klum has insured hers for two million bucks. But in a recent interview on Ellen, she shared that one is actually worth more than the other. What? Klum explained that when she was a kid, she fell into some glass, leaving her with a huge scar on one of her legs. All right, the model said she finds the whole insurance thing weird, that it wasn't even her who insured her legs. It was actually a client. Bizarre. I know. All right, today the nation celebrates a silly old bear. January 18th is National Winnie the Pooh Day. The unofficial holiday coincides with his creator's birthday. A. A. Milne based his stories about the fictional honey loving bear on a black bear at the London Zoo during World War One. Disney bought the rights to Winnie the Pooh in the 1960s, but the original iteration of the character, it's actually in the public domain after its copyright expired this year. Kind of appropriate. We go from Winnie the Pooh Day to our uh, resident Eeyore, I think. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was wondering where you were going with that. But sometimes you're a little bit Tigger, right? Yeah, a little bit. You're a little Tigger, a little, little bit, Eeyore. A little bouncy. Depends. Pointing around on the tail. That's yeah. right. <laughs> you're, you're Eeyore on National Day of. Yes. <laughs> you're Tigger when it comes to thermometers and weather. And everything else. And everything else, yeah. Just those national days. All right. So we have a lot to talk about weather-wise around here. A lot to jump on into. 
First of all, tomorrow, sunny and warm, more of the same, just a few degrees warmer, and I think we'll be around 80 degrees in many locations. Then cold and windy on Thursday, a blustery raw day with a light wintry mix on the way. Let's start with temperatures. We'll go from there, set the stage for that wintry mix. I think cold front, what cold front looking at this map all across the state, 60s and 70s, but let's head north. Uh, Pierce, South Dakota, 24, getting to Minot, one degree. Parts of Montana, northern Minnesota in, in the single digits. That's the colder air that's plunging southward. And so that cold front has formed. It's now moving toward us. Around here, though, we're in the 60s to near 70. Still at this hour, above the average high temperature for the day. Fredericksburg, 64. Catula at 78. Gonzales at 68, 70 officially in San Antonio. As we go through the evening, really uneventful. Mostly clear until we get to after midnight and then tomorrow morning we'll start the day with fog at 54 degrees. By the afternoon, we'll make it well into the 70s with a lot of sunshine. We're thinking about 78 in San Antonio. You get into some outline areas and we'll probably make it to 80 degrees. Uvalde 81, Del Rio 83 tomorrow and Pleasanton about 80. Now actually the sunshine today and the warmth today, along with the sun and warmth tomorrow, I think we'll actually work in our favor when it comes to the wintry mix into Thursday in the sense that it's going to prevent a lot of it from really sticking on most of the roadways because temperatures are going to fall off, but the ground really retains a lot of that warmth from the sun, especially over a couple of day span like we had today and tomorrow. So by Thursday, air temperatures in the 30s, and that's why just the exposed surfaces exposed to the wind in the air. The bridges and overpasses, I think, are the primary concern. So let's talk about the disturbance headed our way. Little bit of moisture with it. Notice not a lot of precipitation activity through Arizona and New Mexico. This isn't going to be heavy precipitation. It's going to be light. That's the disturbance that's headed our way. Tomorrow, just fog in the morning. Could be dense in some locations through about 9, 10 a.m. Then we get into sunshine into the afternoon. Cold front, 4 o'clock, still just outside the hill country. Then it moves through San Antonio about nine o'clock, give or take. And by midnight, we've all had the cold front. Temperatures start to fall off. The wind starts to pick up as well. So let's work our way into Thursday. We'll have little sprinkles developing and those little sprinkles should turn into sprinkles of light freezing rain and little ice pellets or sleet as we get to the late morning, midday into the afternoon. I know this future cast shows a lot of coverage here, but I think it overdoes it a little bit and it's not going to be heavy. That's the other thing to keep in mind. We're expecting this to be very light with very limited moisture to work with. Nonetheless, we're just going to have a mixture of off and on sleet and freezing rain throughout the day on Thursday, but it should be a pretty low impact event. Remember the sunshine today and tomorrow and all that warmth, I think will keep the main roadways and even most sidewalks and side streets just warm enough to stay wet. It's the bridges and overpasses. And in terms of accumulations, maybe we could see up to a tenth or fifteen hundredths of an inch of a little bit of sleet or freezing rain in a few spots, but off and on throughout the day. So what to plan for the light freezing rain and sleet. And remember, sleet, just a refrozen raindrop. It's a raindrop that freezes into a little ice pellet. You hear it go ting, 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 ting outside. I feel like I'm playing the drums with it to ting, 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 ting. Light freezing rain, that's the that's the water that turns into ice when it hits the surface. That's the most problematic, but we're expecting that to be brief. And it's just the concern is some of the bridges and overpasses. It should be localized in terms of the actual impacts of the freezing rain and sleep, but also windy and cold. Keep this in mind. If you work outside on Thursday, it's going to feel like 20 degrees and even in the upper teens. So we'll be 35 in the morning on Thursday, 32 most of the day. And then by Friday in the morning, we're in the 20s, but the afternoon, upper 40s, then only 50s for highs as we get through the weekend. Burr. Yeah, ditto. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning. It is Tuesday, January 18th. Community Labs is playing catch up when it comes to delivering COVID testing results. Last week, a logistic issue caused a delay, and this week, staffing shortages added to the problem. The president of Community Labs, Sal Weber, says people should expect test results in 72 hours. Weber says he hopes the delays are temporary, but he can't promise when they'll be back to their normal turnaround time of 12 to 24 hours. He also says their lab is working as fast as they can to deal with 
the current spike in cases. In your other morning headlines, it's been three years since a deadly explosion in the state of Hidalgo in Mexico. On January 18, 2019, hundreds of people collected gasoline from a clandestine pipeline when a spark caused the pipeline to explode. It's at five, we have breaking news out of Bastrop County. Firefighters are battling a 300 acre grass fire there. This is spreading quickly. Bastrop County right outside of Austin and right now the fire is not at all contained. Yeah, around two this afternoon, Texas A&M Forest Service reported there were 150 acres burning. You can see by the plumes of smoke just how large that fire is now, about double in size. We know residents in the area have been evacuated. San Antonio Police Department's crime stats today showed a 2% overall bump last year compared to 2020, driven by a 4% increase in property crimes. Even though violent crimes fell 9% overall, the spike in homicides caught the eye. We had 160 murders last year as compared to 130 the previous year. A 23% jump over 2020 and the highest number of killings since 1994. Latest on that growing Bastrop fire at 10.